So in this third part, I would like to talk about some practical issues that people face on a daily basis when they implement the GAPS nutritional protocol. And uh, we'll take more questions, because people have questions, apparently a lot of questions. Okay. As it's been covered a little bit already, that majority of GAPS people are fussy eaters. Children are, more obviously, fussy eaters. Uh, a lot of adults are fussy eaters too, uh, which it may, may not be so obvious because they feed themselves, these people. It's often a, a first sign of GAPS. A lot of siblings of GAPS children are fussy eaters. Siblings of autistic children in particular, they may not be autistic, they may not have any learning disabilities, but they usually are afflicted with eczema or asthma or digestive problems, and they universally, quite often, are fussy eaters. What's happening in these children? They have acquired the same gut flora from the same mom, but because of different toxic loads, different constitution, different other factors that might have played during pregnancy and during delivery and at other times in the child's life, they are different and their blood-brain body is intact. So the toxins that their gut flora may be producing are distributed around the body, but the brain is not suffering to the same extent. However, what happens in these children, they usually limit their diet to uh, starchy and sweet things. Why? Because these foods feed abnormal gut flora, candida in particular, clostridia in particular, and other pathogens in the gut. They convert that food into toxic substances, and part of those toxic substances have a structure of opiates. They give the brain a pleasure signal. So the brain wants more. It all happens on a subconscious level. The person doesn't know. So the person gets trapped in a vicious cycle of cravings and dependency, and they crave the very foods that harm them. So they usually limit their diet to sweet, starchy, stodgy, processed things, these children. And they have a solid physiologi physiological reasons for it. It's not just because they're naughty or anything like that. So using behavior modification techniques, we can get 100% success. I have children, this lady gave a wonderful example, a severe example of child actually becoming anorexic. But I have children who survived on one or two food items, or one particular brand they would eat, or nothing else. And they looked like those Ethiopian children from, from that are starving. And yet the uh, mainstream medics were telling them it's all right. It, he'll start eating when he's hungry. Don't worry about it. So using the behavior modification technique, which I have described in detail in my book, in the chapter, is feeding time or no, you can get 100% success. You can change your child's eating habits. You can alter it, and you can make them eat anything and everything you put in front of them. Failure to thrive. As I say, when a baby acquires abnormal gut flora from the start, while the baby is exclusively breastfed, which usually happens for the first six months of life, breast milk virtually doesn't need digesting. It is a perfect food for the baby. This gut flora, this abnormal gut flora may not be a problem. These children are thriving on their mama's, mom's milk. They're growing nicely, they look, all the percentiles are good, all the measurements are good, and the child is doing okay. There may be colic, there may be crying, there may be other problems, or diarrhea, but the child is thriving. When the solids are introduced, if the child has abnormal gut flora and those solids get converted into toxins, then uh, the toxins are irritating gut lining. So from solids, the baby may get tummy ache and the joints might ache and the whole body may ache, they may get a headache, they may have other symptoms, which the baby cannot explain to the parents. They cannot tell what's happening to them. So instinctively they learn that food makes me ill. So they refuse solids, point blank, these children. It is very rare for a baby to get enough nutrition just from breast milk for longer than six months. This situation usually lasts for a few months until the baby starts sliding down the percentiles, starts losing weight, and a diagnosis of failure to thrive usually follows. And these children are usually put on synthetic formulas, on IV drips, all sorts of things are tried, 
And uh, Coke Sing Chui, the, the, the ordinary winning foods that babies are given, which are based on grains and dairy and processed foods. And of course the children refuse it. And it is a struggle for a lot of parents. A lot of children go from one disaster to another, fairly to thrive, they're not eating properly, they're on the synthetic formulas, they're on regular IV drips, they're regular hospitalized uh, because they're not growing and they're losing weight catastrophically, the children. And then they develop autism or they develop ADHD or some other learning abnormalities and other problems with development. So, uh, introducing stories brings gap symptoms, as I've explained. I have got a diet specifically designed for new baby. This diet is described on my website, gaps.me, and it's now described in the book as well. So this is the diet that should be followed for these babies. And breast milk should be used only as a reward after the child has eaten a tiny amount of that food. We start with meat stock, homemade meat stock, and we start with one or two teaspoons per day. So the baby gets that first, either in a bottle or in a beaker or in a teaspoon or something like that, and only then the baby gets breast milk. Initially it may be a bit of a struggle, but babies learn very quickly. They learn that I'm not getting mommy's breast until I've had this spoonful or whatever it is. And gradually once one, two teaspoons are broken, we want more and more and more, we demand more and more meat stock. And as the meat stock is accepted, we add, start adding fermented foods to that, so the probiotic bacteria go in, and of course probiotics, commercially uh, available probiotics are essential to add. And uh, then we start adding soups, and then we start adding raw egg yolks and other things in there, stage by stage, so the whole diet is described. I've got children who have done very well on it. Once parents follow that program, a month, and the baby is eating, and the weight is going back up, and it's fine. Top up with breast milk, continue with the breast milk, and these babies, um, they do well if the breast continues longer than a year. I know in Western culture it isn't common to continue breastfeeding for longer than a year, but these children benefit greatly if you continue for 18 months to two years breastfeeding. Some moms do it even longer. Supplementation. It's an important part of GAF's nutritional protocol, but I do not recommend a lot of supplements, and the supplements that I use are really foods. They're not so much pure supplements. An effective probiotic is very important. Vitamin A, D, in a form of cod liver oil is very important, and here at Western A. Price you have got the best cod liver oil that there is, the fermented cod liver oil. <coughs> Essential fatty acids, there's a lot of research to show that they do improve learning ability in hyperactive children, in autistic children, and other children. Obviously, there's a question of purity, there's a question of how they extract it, um, but there are many good brands on the market, and particularly in the initial stages, these oils are very helpful for these children to top up their brain nutrition and their abilities to learn. Multivitamin, mineral, and amino acid supplement, that is prescribed on an individual basis. That is not a blanket prescription for everybody. If you work on the diet, if you introduce liver, if you introduce all the other foods, you don't need this supplement. It isn't necessary. For certain people with certain symptoms, we can bring those symptoms down quite quickly with targeted supplementation. And in these cases, it's better to work with a practitioner, with, with an experienced practitioner. I prescribe to quite a few of my patients amino acids which boost production of neurotransmitters in the brain, particularly in children who have various tics and involuntary movements, head bobbing and strange movements. Tourette syndrome responds beautifully to supplementation, targeted supplementation of amino acids. We need tryptophan for serotonin, we need tyrosine for dopamine and norepinephrine, we need glutamine for GABA and some other neurotransmitters, as, uh, uh, some other amino acids as supportive nutrients and B vitamins for these patients. So there are some supplements that I use as a targeted supplementation. Digestive enzymes, these are very helpful. In children, I don't recommend to introduce HDL and pepsin right from the beginning. Later on, if burping and belching is a big problem, then it helps, adding that in tiny amounts at the beginning of the food to the first mouthfuls of food. But it is better for these children and for adults as well to say, I say, third of a cup of cabbage juice, freshly pressed, 
or juice from 